My name is Christina Weiland, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Michigan. I direct the Equity and Early Learning Lab at the School of Education, and I'm a core faculty member at the Education Policy Initiative Center at the um, Ford School of Public Policy. So thank you all for joining, and thank you especially for your patience with the uh, tech issue today. We're all learning uh, in this new format. It's our first virtual EPI event. Um, we are really pleased today to welcome Dr. Yoshikawa. Um, he is a renowned expert in early childhood education. He's the Courtney Sale Roth Professor of Globalization and Education at NYU Steinhardt. He's co-director of the Global Ties for Children Center at NYU with Dr. Larry Aber. And most recently, he was also a member of the Biden Sanders Education Unity Task Force. Um, and we're extremely lucky to have him here today uh, to hear about his really extraordinary work uh, that he's leading to bring early education to young refugee children in parts of the world affected by humanitarian crises. So his project has been very generously funded by two $100 million grants, one from the MacArthur Foundation and one from the Lego Foundation. And it's in partnership with the Sesame Workshop and the IRC. I'm gonna hand it over to Hiro momentarily, but just a few kind of administrative notes before that. Um, I'm gonna acknowledge and thank the co-sponsors for the exciting uh, talk today, the Education Policy Initiative here at the Ford School of Public Policy, uh, the School of Education, and the Equity and Early Learning Lab. We are recording the talk and it'll be posted on the website for those who would like to access it later. And Dr. Yoshikawa today is gonna to talk for about 50 minutes. Um, hang on tight and stick around though. We'll have time about 20 minutes or so for Q&A from the audience. And please, as um, you have questions, type them into the Zoom Q&A as opposed to the chat. That's the way that we'll be keeping track of them and consolidating them um, so that we can have a hopefully rich discussion at the end of the talk. Um, so without further ado, um, Hiro, I'm happy to um, hand it over to you and thank you again so much for being here today to share this important work with us. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, it's a real pleasure to quote unquote, be there. Um, I really wish I, I was able to um, get there because um, you know, I have lots of uh, friends and colleagues, uh, um, both at the Ford School uh, and the School of Education at, uh, elsewhere at the University of Michigan. So um, thanks very much for this invite. Um, and uh, uh, so um, I look forward to your questions afterwards too. So, um, I'm going to talk, um, and I have to say, I think at the uh, when we arranged this, the date for this talk, um, it might have been uh, just before COVID or around that time when uh, we didn't quite realize that, of course, um, a whole variety of plans, um, including uh, uh, you know everyday lives, livelihoods, routines. Um, health um, and uh, economic well-being would be drastically affected by COVID-19. So um, the title of this talk has shifted a little bit to reflect that. And so I'll be talking a little bit about parenting interventions. You may wonder why the shift from early childhood education to parenting. Well, I think many of you have experienced um, that or are experiencing that shift, um, which is that families are bearing the brunt uh, of much of the pandemic um, when we think about uh, education. So um, I'm going to talk first um, a little bit very briefly about the challenges of COVID-19 globally for parenting and child development. Um, talk a little bit about, um, uh, I'm going to be concentrating mainly on what um, an NGO partnership has done um, and is doing um, to pivot a little bit in terms of its ECD uh, initiatives. Um, but I also wanted to start with an innovative example um, because I think it is interesting at the national level um, by a Ministry of Education in a country that has um, greatly varying access to things like the internet. So um, tell you a little bit about some innovative uh, work um, to begin in, in Peru. Um, and then I'll spend most of the talk talking about an initiative for the Syrian refugee response region. Um, uh, in the Middle East and how two uh, parenting programs uh, have been developed in response to the COVID pandemic um, in, uh, and how uh, we're evaluating those. So the challenges of parenting in ECD um, uh, during COVID-19 are things that I think many of you are um, uh, experiencing directly. Um, so, and in low and middle income countries, I think these crises have been um, 
uh, even uh, in some cases further heightened. And these are crises of economic and food insecurity, job loss, forced migration, um, mental health and well-being challenges that are widespread, um, including um, evidence of uh, increases in risk of um, domestic violence from a variety of countries around the world. Um, closing and disruptions of existing ECD programming, um, which include childcare and early education, but also in-person caregiver and parenting uh, support and child protection services. Um, and I would also include services for kids with disabilities here, um, which have been severely affected. Um, there are, uh, of course, widespread lack of access to the internet, um, not only in the United States, but certainly in many, many low and middle income countries uh, for remote or distance interventions. And when programs open, um, the challenges of social distancing at a developmental period when that is just not the norm for uh, uh, developing young kids. So I'm going to start with a national government response, um, which has been um, quite innovative. And I think one of the models in Latin America, which is work by the Ministry of Education in uh, Peru. Um, and just to give some context, Peru is actually an upper middle income country, um, and, uh, but has a great deal of inequality. And so you see that uh, very little internet access in rural areas, um, about 40% access in urban areas, and even in the capital of Lima, only half of the students have internet access. Um, what the Ministry of Education developed was daily broadcasts with set times for different grades and age ranges. Um, and uh, this is on the national radio and TV networks. And um, these follow a curricula that the Ministry of Education has. And so they kind of meet some of the learning standards for the country. Um, for pre-primary, uh, they do include Plaza Sesamo, which is the Latin American version of Sesame Street. And they distinguish within the early childhood development period um, between activities, learning activities um, uh, within early childhood for the first two years of life, age three, four, and five, and then pair grades uh, later in primary education. This is all also available in terms of the materials online. And any of you who are interested, um, the program is called Aprendo en Casa um, by the Ministry of Education. And so, um, here are some examples of um, uh, I, uh, a, a, a tweet about the first day of class um, for a preschooler. Um, these messages around COVID, um, around washing hands and um, in both kind of rural uh, contexts and urban contexts and everyday play kinds of activities. Their schedule, um, importantly, um, has the, these virtual and remote models that they set up very, very quickly. And so they were on um, as of, um, I believe, May. And um, uh, they recognized that there would be a lot of variation in learning by the time of the next school year. And so they have um, planned uh, individual child learning evaluations and efforts to provide instruction at the child's level of learning at the beginning of this uh, current uh, school year. Um, so that's an example very briefly of um, uh, what a Ministry of Education has done in a middle income country uh, context. Um, I'm gonna spend uh, most of the rest of the talk talking about a particular partnership um, where we are involved in the research and evaluation, uh, which is the partnership of the International Rescue Committee or IRC and Sesame Workshop in four countries in the Middle East. Um, and as Chris mentioned, this was um, an awardee of a uh, award mechanism at MacArthur Foundation called 100 and Change, uh, which was a wide open um, competition to fund a single proposal promising real and measurable progress in solving a critical problem of our time. So there were uh, many applicants, um, there were about 18 months of lots of work to put together this proposal after um, this partnership was identified as um, a semi-final, one of the eight semi-finalist proposals. And um, the argument for um, this uh, solution uh, was that um, there's a real gap, um, despite the worldwide um, uh, increase in investment in early childhood development that was driven by the strong economic and neuroscience and evaluation evidence of the past several decades, um, that had really not hit the humanitarian sector. So if, um, 
in an article with Katie Murphy and Alice Wormley, um, we looked at national refugee response plans um, for the 30 or so countries that had the largest humanitarian crises. Um, and uh, uh, less than half mentioned early education. Um, and uh, less than a third mentioned anything about parenting um, uh, or supporting parents. And so there had been um, a real gap in investment or consideration of early childhood development services um, beyond those for survival. And that, um, of course, on, on one level makes a lot of sense because the humanitarian sector is addressing crises of migration or uh, man-made or armed conflict or natural disasters where the first priorities are survival. So their health, shelter, food, clothing, um, so those basics. And so early childhood development beyond that, which is really about learning and thriving and supporting um, uh, children's development across domains um, uh, beyond survival um, had really not been a priority. Um, and it is still not uh, widespread in the um, official refugee response plans, which are one indicator of policy level um, acknowledgement of um, priorities. So the rationale we made for an audience that was perhaps not familiar with the early childhood development field. It will be familiar to many of you and which are the um, Harvard Center on the Developing Child um, uh, messages on translating the science of early childhood development, um, talking about how brain architecture um, is formed in the earliest years of life and is supported by the interaction of genes and experience. Um, talking about the critical uh, role of um, responsive caregiving and um, serve and return interactions between adults and uh, infants, toddlers um, that build um, the connections, um, uh, that build brain architecture in their early years, and how um, stress, um, uh, such as the stress that can be experienced um, uh, both before a flight, during flight, and in the host um, community as adjustment to after migration occurs, all of these um, can um, uh, foster uh, levels of stress that can uh, affect um, early children's um, development. Um, we also built um, in the rationale around the economic evidence um, from work by uh, Jerry Behrman, um, Florencia Lopez, uh, and others. Um, talking about the societal cost of not investing in high quality pre-primary education and parenting interventions um, and noting that these um, costs of not investing are higher in the context of the lowest access um, and so therefore the comparison or the counterfactual matters for um, investments um, and therefore in in the humanitarian context where there's um, been very very low levels of investment that there may be a rationale for doing this we also highlighted that there may be a whole variety of platforms um, and services on which to build early childhood development services and they include not just child care and early education um, but social protection programs like um, cash transfer or cash grant kind of programs, uh, nutrition programs, um, health, um, child protection programs, and sanitation and hygiene uh, programs, all of which are um, part of the uh, picture when it comes to humanitarian crises um, and services. So um, that was some of the rationale for the investment. So what was the actual solution? I'm going to um, present the video that uh, will give a little bit of the kinds of services um, that uh, we proposed at the time of the finalist presentation. Um, so we'll see if this uh, works and um, uh, hopefully the sound will, and the video will, well, sorry. صباح الخير كيف حالك our early childhood program begins in the home whether it's a shelter a tent a crowded apartment it doesn't matter كيفك يا امين the most important thing is that the children need to be with their parents 
the first caregivers with whom they will build trusting relationships and learn new things in order for them to be able to build knowledge on the long run. Ah, okay. We give them activities to promote reading, learning the alphabet, counting, a lot of language skills. We empower the parents with skills to support their child's development. They can play with them using objects that they can find in their homes. We show them how to communicate with their children frequently in a way that promotes praise. Most of the parents that I work with, when we first meet, they describe their role as shelter provider, food provider, as the one who's making sure that their children survive. Yet with time, they start engaging with their children and they would say, I used to do this in Syria, but I was not able to do it anymore with my kids. Thank you for helping me. Wow. خوفتهم يعني في عندهم حالة إنه غير الأطفال العاديين اللي هني رحين على المدرسة فنحن لحتى نرجع لهم ثقتهم بنفسهم بدنا نحاول نحن نعملهم هاي كلهم نعملهم المكان الآمن نعملهم البيئة الآمنة لحتى هني بيشعروا بالثقة والمدرسة ما عملت له شيء فهني أكيد راح تأثر بالمستقبل راح يبنوا مجتمع أكيد راح يكون مجتمع عمي مجتمع فعال أكيد So um, that gives you a little bit of a sense of where the services were um, actually before the start of the initiative. So it gives you a sense that there was already a partnership between Sesame Workshop um, and the International Rescue Committee. And so in fact, the service model is both um, the development of a mass media program that would be the first version of um, Sesame uh, uh, Street in essence, um, uh, that would be tailored for the Syrian refugee response region in four countries in the Middle East. Um, then direct services that are both um, uh, caregiver or parent focused services and then child or early care and education focused services and then our research um, and policy agenda for partnerships and uh, there I'm not going to talk very much about the policy partnerships but there are extensive um, collaborations now that have been developed with the ministries of um, education um, uh, health or social protection uh, depending on the country in this uh, initiative so um, these are the service areas as they existed um, just before the time um, of the proposal um, and they're roughly still um, they've expanded um, uh, in uh, Jordan um, uh, in particular um, but these are still roughly the service areas um, uh, currently in these four areas of the Middle East which is called the Levant area of the Middle East so I'm going to quickly go through the mass media and then uh, talk through a little bit of the parenting interventions so um, Ahlan Simpson's first season launched in February of 2020, and um, uh, it is set in a uh, kind of a urban neighborhood that's a, a little bit of a conglomeration of um, a kind of a, an area that might be um, a mid-sized um, uh, city or town in Jordan uh, with aspects of some of the other countries. Um, 
Uh, Basma uh, grew up in this neighborhood, whereas Jod is a newcomer to the neighborhood, but um, it's never really stated where he's from. Um, but the dialects represented um, reflect a variety of dialects within the four countries, and there were um, lots and lots of um, discussions and input from language experts around how to represent um, uh, the variety of dialects among um, uh, migrant populations, um, host community populations, and diversity in the host community in these four countries. Um, the other unusual decision um, uh, that was made to really focus on one area of young children's development, which is emotions, coping, and self-regulation strategies for the first season, and more broadly around social and emotional development for the further seasons. Um, and the second season um, is now um, on the air, and uh, the third season is being developed uh, for this next uh, year. A multi-generational cast was surrounding these new characters. There's other new characters. There are live um, uh, human actors. Um, I didn't quite know this, but there are humanoids, animals, um, uh, uh, monsters. Um, there's a whole uh, categorization of um, Sesame Workshop kinds of characters. Um, these were developed with a lot of input from uh, uh, local um, uh, residents, experts, parental preferences, informative research, but also a organization called Jordan Pioneers, which is a leading children's media organization in Jordan. Um, the second half of every 26 minute um, episode is an actual variety show with a live audience, um, children of, uh, um, and celebrities from the region and situations that explore the same emotions and coping strategies that are in the first part. The first part of each episode looks um, uh, uh, like a kind of traditional format with a mix of Muppets and uh, live actors and some animation. Um, so um, in our impact evaluation, um, uh, we considered a couple alternatives, one of which is to actually study naturalistic home viewing. Um, and that uh, would have been an ambitious uh, project to actually develop an intervention to increase home viewing and use that to leverage the impact of home viewing on children's outcomes. Um, because of the uncertainty of those kinds of interventions, um, we went for the uh, other option, which was to um, screen entire seasons in preschools with about, you know, a, a 26 minutes um, of a preschool day devoted to particular episodes and to screen episodes daily over a three month period. Um, in this case, in government preschools in Jordan with relatively high proportions of refugee origin uh, children. Um, and we considered two potential control conditions, an alternative uh, mass media children's um, TV program a whole set of 26 minute episodes, which we actually created um, with nature content, but the Jordanian Ministry of Education actually um, uh, came back to us and said that they really preferred us to um, uh, contrast it with their business as usual preschool curriculum without an additional um, uh, alternative uh, program. So um, that's what we are planning. Um, we've done a lot of measure development around emotions, um, which are really complex and of course culturally specific. And so uh, developing vignettes um, for emotion regulation and coping strategies um, and piloting those uh, in Jordan. Um, and then of course the preschool shut down. So, uh, so we're uh, uh, delayed and we've had to increase the sample size of schools to to revise our effect size, accounting for the fact that by the time the RCT starts, um, uh, more, more people overall, more kids overall um, in Jordan will have seen um, uh, the Ahlan Simpson TV show. Ahlan Simpson means welcome sesame. Um, and so uh, Sesame Seeds was the uh, title of our initiative in the proposal, but um, it is uh, called Ahlan Simpson. Um, then turning to the direct services, there are both programs for children, which are, um, child care, preschool, they can be um, uh, relatively non-formal kinds of um, child care programs. Uh, some might be um, satellites to um, multi-service centers like women's empowerment centers um, or health and nutrition based clinics, um, or they can be full-fledged preschools. Um, uh, with um, the, such as you saw in Lebanon, uh, those were in the Bekaa Valley in Lebanon in the video. Um, but I'm going to concentrate a little bit on programs for caregivers, um, uh, which also include both kind of high contact of what we call high contact and low contact programs. 
Um, and the high contact ones are more in the area of home visiting, which is quite familiar to those in the US. And the model that was developed um, and had already been piloted at the time that the proposal was put into MacArthur uh, was a um, uh, adaptation by the Arab Network on Early Childhood Development, an NGO um, in uh, a regional NGO based in Beirut of a program called Reach Up and Learn, which is um, focused on parenting responsiveness and stimulation and early development for six month olds to 36 month olds. Um, it had been initially implemented in Jamaica, probably starting about 30 years ago. Um, and in a 20 year um, follow up of a small scale RCT, um, participants um, who had been infants and toddlers um, uh, in the full program um, showed increased earnings, educational attainment, decreased depression, and crime. Um, so the Reach Up and Learn program has been adapted for, for example, national use called, in a program called Kunamas in Peru. Um, and this version uh, was adapted um, by this uh, NGO and it takes the form of biweekly visits in a 12 month program. Um, and uh, in the context uh, of these countries, the IRC has implemented it based in different kinds of workforces, um, but in Jordan um, uh, added to health and nutrition messages. Um, so we did um, a pilot study of participants, about um, 200 uh, caregivers and about 40 um, home visitors. And um, some of our qualitative quotes um, uh, included, they were uniformly positive once they got into the program, but they did um, admit uh, these caregivers that this um, uh, was initially somewhat of a bizarre program, that this idea of someone coming to the house and playing with a very young child was just not a norm um, in this context. Um, but um, at this point, which was after about five months of home visits, um, there were some consistent themes. And this is work by Ifra Magan um, and Salma El Kaudi. Um, uh, Ifra is on the Faculty of Social Work at NYU. Um, and uh, some consistent themes around the salience of an attention to child learning, that um, there were a lot of kind of aha moments about um, uh, not realizing that um, children this age were um, doing the kinds of things that they were doing in the home visits and capable of learning from them. Um, so uh, this idea of being interested and finding out what are the hidden talents or skills of kids that I don't, I don't know of. Um, uh, caring about um, that child more specifically, and many of these families had other children. Um, now I do, I sit with her and I teach her a song, for example, after a while she can sing it on her own. Um, the caregivers also made some suggestions for the program, such as more visits or extending to children older than three, um, leaving toys uh, behind because this was um, uh, in the original model was about rotating toys. Um, and so toy making was added as a stronger emphasis in the revision of the program and some of the larger context around addressing financial insecurity. And for those of you who know the context of um, Jordan and this area, you know, about an hour away from the capital, it is a very expensive country. Um, and so the um, cash grants, the limitations on employment for um, refugee populations made for um, high levels of salience of financial um, insecurity. The workforce supports that were raised by um, home visitors and implementation research included um, attention to the caseload, um, to the stress of conducting home visits, um, the schedules of families versus home visitors, um, and um, uh, the request for more in-service professional development to support um, their needs and for peer support. And so um, uh, partly in response, um, starting um, in uh, early 2019, the IRC started implementing continuous quality improvement approaches, um, which um, those of you familiar with kind of Tony Brake and the Carnegie um, Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, this is that very model, um, applied um, for the first time to um, ECD in a humanitarian uh, context. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened after COVID. Um, and that is that, of course, home visits stopped. Um, and so um, with the lockdown in Jordan, um, uh, this question of how could um, 
parenting supports be provided um, in a context uh, where home visits are no longer possible. And so um, this week uh, we are um, uh, training data collectors for um, um, our first program evaluation post COVID, which is um, uh, a RCT on the phone based reach up and learn. And so this was um, created uh, and adapted in a very fast <laughs> pace of um, uh, probably something like five or six weeks um, by a team from the IRC who specialize in early childhood development. Um, and uh, this kind of workforce of community health volunteers um, who are stipended and um, majority Syrian in background uh, were um, trained now to provide a model on the phone, um, which includes um, um, features that um, I'm certainly now hearing are common features in multiple phone-based models in various parts of the world, um, uh, in Latin America, um, in South Asia, um, in uh, the Middle East, which includes um, a check-in around COVID, co providing COVID-related information, and strategies for prevention and health and hygiene, um, a caregiver well-being check-in, um, and then um, getting to activities kind of third on the list, which is in this case, um, the reach up and learn activities that are feasible to accomplish in the home. Um, this is still targeted to the age range of the child. Um, it is still targeted to the children's learning level. One feature of reach up and learn is that the sequence of activities and toys is targeted to what the child can do. And if the, it's too easy for the child, they move on to the next level. And if it's too difficult, they move back. Um, and there's a whole sequence um, of these. Um, this is now a selection. Um, the majority of the activities were retained, um, but they had to be adapted. And there are certainly limits, which I'm happy to talk more about on the phone, which is that you cannot actually do a lot of demonstration. Um, you can't um, rely on, you know, this is not a, a context where there's a lot of FaceTime or anything like that. Um, and even with that, to um, hold a child, um, play with, uh, do a certain activity with the child, talk to the uh, a caller at the same time and get feedback. Um, these are the kind of normal things that go on in a home visit. Those are just become um, uh, nearly impossible when it's on the phone. Um, but the activities themselves are retained um, and this is currently being implemented in uh, Jordan and our impact evaluation will occur in one area um, at the very north uh, uh, end uh, border of Jordan um, with um, about uh, 80 home visitors and their caseloads randomized either to um, the health and nutrition kinds of content and the COVID information or health, nutrition and reach up and learn um, content. Um, and this gives you a little bit of a sense of some of the sample activities by visit um, that are uh, within three month age um, buckets. Um, and uh, this is a, a sense of uh, the theory of change. Um, one of the um, things that we are um, going to be measuring is, um, which uh, we think is uh, one of the first times in the ECD field is to actually quote unquote observe quality, um, the observed quality of the calls. And of course you don't, you're not observing, you're listening to them. So, um, so these are audio recordings. Um, and we have a draft quality measure um, developed by uh, um, a team, uh, a members of our team at Global Ties. Um, we are hypothesizing some parent well-being, um, uh, so depressive mood, anxious mood, um, levels of stress, um, engagement in parenting, um, activities related to responsive care, um, reductions in harsh discipline, engagement in the activities, and um, because of the phone-based um, low contact nature of this and the fact that certain aspects like feedback, live feedback are um, less prominent, uh, our child development outcomes will measure them, but they're exploratory. And for those of you um, who are used to the kind of idea of registering clinical uh, experimental evaluations, we will not be registering the child development um, outcomes as uh, primary hypothesized outcomes, but mainly thinking about the parent process kinds of um, outcomes. Um, 
we had done a pilot sample when this was planned to be an RCT of the in-person home visiting. Um, and uh, we did test a lot of the measures which we are now going to be gathering through phone surveys. Um, so we did uh, a, a lot of kinds of measures, qualitative um, quotes that you already um, saw, observational measures of quality of home visits, um, direct child development and survey and a whole array of survey measures and did a whole variety of these validation analyses. And after um, iterative um, revisions, we were able to get to some pretty good, um, we're pretty happy with most of uh, the survey measures. Um, here are um, some of our findings around parenting, stress, efficacy, anxiety, depression, well-being, and sleep, um, which were related to each other in hypothesized um, directions um, with a pretty good fit. Um, but some of the other areas required some revision. So our initial child development measure adapted for this context um, uh, didn't quite capture some of the domains um, that uh, we think were targeted in a kind of fine-grained enough way. So we're moving to a longer child development uh, measure when we get back into the field. Um, but um, unfortunately for a phone survey, we can't really do a direct assessment. Um, and so for the phone survey, we'll be using a thing called the ages and stages um, questionnaire for parent reported child outcomes. Again, those are exploratory in the phone-based version. Um, uh, so that's that uh, evaluation. I also wanted to tell you a little bit about a text messaging intervention that was also developed um, since COVID um, for a even wider scale. Um, and again, by the same team at the IRC. Um, and this is designed um, to uh, benefit um, not just IRC beneficiaries, but uh, beneficiaries of a large array of other NGOs in the four countries of Ahlan Simpson. Um, and um, similarly a mix, but these are text messages. So there's not much um, uh, in here about a kind of interactive back and forth around well-being and coping, for example. Um, but um, uh, things like ECD awareness messages, COVID awareness messages, and then activities to do with their children at home that are then based on the child age covering different areas of development and some activities including pictures or links to Ahlan Simpson videos. This is an example of what some of the messages might um, look like um, and the idea that some might be accompanied by illustrations and um, some can be accompanied by audio messages and some can be accompanied by short videos that demonstrate what an activity uh, looks like. Um, our theory of change similarly here is that um, we are, uh, and we're, we're, we're probably um, a little more on the left of this theory of change because it's even less intensive, right, than a phone-based uh, model where you're um, getting a phone call uh, uh, once every week or so from a, a, a community health worker. In this case, you're getting texts, and so our First um, question that the IRC was interested in was um, in thinking about different implementation factors, uh, what would um, uh, prompt the highest level of engagement with the text? And um, that is the first um, purple box in the middle uh, set of intermediate outcomes. So it's kind of a first order question. Um, the intervention is still being um, optimized. And so the question that we're working with the IRC to answer is before we get to a formal impact evaluation, which types of messages maximize caregiver engagement? And we're measuring caregiver engagement by taking, um, uh, uh, working with the texting platform uh, NGO called Bayamo um, to um, split messages in two so that there is an introductory message about what the topic is. And today, you know, we have information about this kind of activity. Would you like to see the activity? And then the um, uh, caregiver or someone and whoever has the phone in the family would have to actually press something on the phone to get the rest of the message. And so we think of that as a behavioral engagement um, indicator. Um, and for those of you who know WhatsApp, um, the reason we're doing this is because on WhatsApp, you can get a first blue check, which is that the message was received or delivered. And then the second one, which is that it was opened. Um, but um, beyond that, you have no idea um, whether uh, a caregiver has actually engaged with it. So um, 
so we have that measure of caregiver engagement, which is the kind of first order um, uh, outcome. And we have this question about whether that differs across different formats, whether a text is accompanied by an audio message, um, text message only, a message with a picture or a message with a video. Uh, other questions like the time of day, um, and then um, of course qualitative questions about how these texts were um, uh, and messages were received and what kind of meaning making uh, uh, happened, what were some of the barriers um, uh, to perhaps engaging in it, um, did the activities you know, uh, make sense within their daily routine, those kinds of um, questions. Um, but to optimize, and we're optimizing to this notion of behavioral engagement with a text, um, the IRC um, had a first set of questions, which was about the modality of the attachment, um, and also whether receiving awareness messages in addition to um, versus receiving an activity message only without a kind of ECD awareness message was another question. Um, uh, we're still considering some other questions like uh, messages in the morning versus the evening and receiving reminder messages about the last activity. Um, so to test this, uh, um, we're using a, an approach called the multi-phase optimization design or the most design, which Linda Collins um, has written a couple of books uh, about. Um, she has just moved to NYU from Penn State. Um, and this is um, an approach to test multiple intervention components and try to understand what is the optimal combination of um, quote unquote active ingredients um, before you do an, uh, a kind of summative impact evaluation. And what it uh, basically is, is a multifactorial design um, with um, two condition factors. So um, uh, each component um, uh, is required to have a, a uh, a binary kind of um, on off or a um, that component versus an, versus an alternative component or comparison. Um, and then you can um, test uh, multiple ones simultaneously uh, without this kind of traditional notion of you needing a very large sample with a multi-arm experiment. And that's because it's a full factorial design. So to give you a little bit of a sense of this, um, this is what um, a uh, four research question, two by two by two by two factorial design would look like. There would be 16 cells. And in this case, there's 25 per cell and a total sample size of 400. And you can see that um, right now the shaded versus the white is the comparison between a written text only versus a voice note accompanying the text. But you see the columns across um, uh, incorporating three other research questions, which are video versus no video, images versus no images, and an ECD awareness message um, versus no ECD awareness message prior to the activity. So that in total gives you 16 cells with 25 per cell, and a comparison of this research question of written versus voice note of um, 200 versus 200. Um, then, um, uh, for this alternative um, condition, moving over to the second uh, experimental condition column for videos versus no video, um, you would do the um, these blue um, uh, cells versus the white cells, and, and that would again be 200 versus 200. So you can see that with a, a, a full factorial design like this, that you have the equal power to test every single condition with a relatively um, modest sample size of 400 um, instead of uh, uh, something that might involve um, uh, a five-arm um, experiment, for example. So um, right now we are in um, uh, the final stages of defining the um, components for the pilot um, to test the feasibility and the use of the Viamo platform for this most design. The main phase would be an N of 2,000 per country um, in Lebanon, Jordan, Iraq, um, and uh, northeast and northwest Syria. Um, and um, for uh, a phone survey follow-up, we would be looking at outcomes beyond that, um, you know, one check versus two check versus uh, uh, a text back um, engagement measure to include some of these things like self-reported engagement in the activity. Um, the most phase can be repeated to answer emerging or new implementation kinds of questions. Um, so if the qualitative data show that there are some other 
factors that uh, might be incorporated as active ingredients into a text-based um, series um, uh, that could be done in another most phase. Um, but then the idea is that per country, there may be a, a quote unquote optimized program um, that could be the focus of a traditional RCT kind of impact evaluation, which is planned for 2021. So that gives you a sense of the two um, current um, uh, um, distance or mobile uh, uh, interventions that we're um, evaluating currently. Uh, we do plan to get back into the field um, in both um, this initiative and one in Bangladesh for Rohingya refugees um, uh, when the reopening uh, permits and with our research uh, um, uh, uh, partners on the ground um, and with uh, Sesame. Um, the IRC and BRAC, which is the NGO we work with in Bangladesh. Um, so just to wrap up, um, some cross-cutting implementation issues that um, we're observing from not just these initiatives, but multiple country uh, level um, efforts, um, which is a new integration of health, nutrition, protection, and education. And I think this is absolutely also true in the United States, which is that schools um, uh, have uh, you know, there is a greater urgency to provide multi-service um, uh, community school kinds of approaches, for example, when communities um, are varying um, so hugely in their patterns of um, stresses, of um, job loss um, in international contexts, um, migration, um, food insecurity, um, and uh, uh, the kind of uh, withdrawal of reduced kinds of services um, and uh, community supports. There is an emerging quality measurement agenda, which we're participating in um, with work on evaluating uh, phone-based interventions in uh, the Middle East and India and Bangladesh. Um, uh, we're also coordinating with work in Latin America with the Inter-American Development Bank on some of these same kinds of issues. Um, to compare notes around uh, measures and how we think of uh, research and evaluation, both on the monitoring and evaluation or implementation side and the impact evaluation side um, across countries. One theme that's come up a lot is the caller's well-being and stress. Um, so first of all, there is rescheduling going on. During lockdown, I think um, during the most extreme lockdown, caregivers and parents were the most available. As there's hybrid or partial reopening, that um, changes. Um, and callers' well-being and stress is a huge issue because everyone is under uh, the situation of COVID. Everyone is dealing uh, with this and this on top of kind of the, the usual workforce stresses of working with families, but working um, with caregivers who have um, heightened levels of stress and basic needs themselves in many cases, um, with callers themselves often from refugee backgrounds, um, for example, in a BRAC program um, called Besides You, in uh, for the Rohingya and Cox's Bazaar. These are some of the themes that are emerging. So there's a lot of well-being of the workforce and support um, for the workforce that's required. Um, there's a lot of variation in household control of who controls the phone, who answers the phone, and the need to kind of think about fathers, um, grandparents, uh, extended family members as, um, as uh, households are um, facing um, the stresses of COVID together um, and often with, um, you know, kind of a, a new way to think about how the family unit is functioning in the context of COVID. Um, all the complexities that we know from the United States and the variation of reopening levels and reclosing, um, and then how to address um, perhaps these increases in the variation in learning levels when um, children return um, uh, or children don't return. Um, so uh, these, are, these are some of the uh, uh, huge challenges. I want to thank you, um, look forward to your questions and thank our partners and the funders, the Lego Foundation, um, the MacArthur Foundation, um, and our partners, BRAC, the IRC, um, uh, and my colleagues at uh, uh, the Global Ties for Children Center at NYU. Um, thanks uh, so much. I think rather than, okay. That's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> oh, I think you're muted. I'm not unmuted. <laughs> okay. I was saying thank you, Hero, so much. This is the part where if everyone was unmuted, there would be applause. Um, so, you know, we can impute that at the moment. But um,
Uh, we wanted to remind everyone uh, that we do have some time for Q&A for about uh, 20 minutes or so, so please feel free to go ahead and enter any questions you might have um, into the box, and I will certainly kick us off and, you know, to, to take a, uh, get us moving with a question um, that I had as I heard um, of this terrific talk, which was around um, how in working with parents, from such different cultural um, contexts, how do you think about um, sort of this idea of what makes a good parent and how it differs across culture as you're thinking um, about how to reach them through phone and also, you know, the in-person work that was happening before COVID hit? Right, um, so that's a great question. Um, and it is um, a theme that did come up in some of the qualitative work. And so I do think it is absolutely vital um, to do the kind of uh, work um, to inquire about daily routines, about goals, values, and socialization practices. Um, and so one area, for example, that comes up as a, a fairly consistent theme across some qualitative work in both Lebanon um, and in Jordan is the notion of faith and religion as sources of coping um, and also of socialization and also of goals for children and goals for um, aspects of education that incorporate faith and religion, for example, are, are themes uh, that come up. So I think um, these, that's just an example, um, but I think um, our approach in our qualitative work is to, um, in the traditional work on culture and human development in early childhood, to um, consider the, the daily routines, but also the values and goals of parents. Um, and so I think that um, is uh, absolutely affects everything from the workforce and the selection of the workforce to the training and the content of interventions. Um, so that's, um, yeah, that's absolutely, I think an important piece um, uh, that emerges. And I think it's, um, yeah, so COVID has driven a kind of a widening of the sense of the kinds of supports that families need. Um, but I think what you're raising is also the kind of cultural um, aspects. Um, I didn't have time to talk about the Bangladesh program that Brock has developed, but that was really, um, their curricular and their approaches um, were based on pretty extensive qualitative work um, with the, in the early months of the Rohingya influx around the kinds of socialization practices with kids, the arts kinds of activities um, and the actual arts, the chants, um, the uh, songs, the, um, the visual layout and um, aspects that uh, these families were used to in their um, homes in Rakhine province in Myanmar. And so those were um, some of the uh, early learning centers that Brack constructed, about 300 of them, um, actually incorporate um, Rohingya arts and look more like Rohingya homes in Myanmar than there are, um, of course, these like very, very crowded dwellings in the camps themselves. So these are some of the only places that actually look like traditional Rohingya um, kind of uh, arts and those were kind of community members who, who did that and they've incorporated a lot of that into the content of their curriculum and the kinds of stories and the kind of um, moral lessons that lie behind the stories and the stories that are set in the kinds of landscapes and um, countryside of their origin um, and so th that's an interesting part of the kinds of story curricula um, that are in the um, pre-primary two to four and four to six year old um, programs that we're looking at in that context. Um, so we are getting some Q&A, so I will, I will read for our, uh, our folks who have joined us. Um, so this is from Professor Michelle uh, Bellino at the um, University of Michigan School of Education. She's asking, um, can you talk a bit more about how you are supporting adults in these children's lives to work on their own coping strategies in such a difficult context? And so somewhat related to the last question as well. Right, um, so that's really important. The telecounseling aspects of, the, of these programs, um, we're finding vary, um, but there's, um, there's a near universal need um, kind of uh, uh, that comes up in calls um, for the, um, addressing the various levels of um, uh, both basic needs and um, stress and kind of uh, coping. And so the, 
approaches that we've found um, uh, ourselves kind of involved with, with with partners are things like telecounseling kinds of approaches. Um, one of our research scientists um, uh, founded the very first um, national crisis hotline in Bangladesh. And so she has provided input to BRAC on the approaches to training um, phone callers um, to integrate um, aspects of telecounseling, um, both in Bangladesh, and she's doing some of that work in India and also translating some of that for the IRC as well. Um, because I think this was um, absolutely something that um, you could not go straight to activities. You have to actually um, think about the um, how to how to do the open-ended questioning, some of the features of reflective listening and active listening that are really the bread and butter of um, both crisis intervention um, and how that would um, uh, enrich these conversations. So yeah, so those are some of the uh, aspects and it's, um, uh, but that does require its own um, sets of training and, and focus of, in the training. And broadly, um, what are the biggest differences you're seeing in terms of putting an ECD program like this um, in place in a humanitarian context versus a more stable non-crisis setting? So thinking of, you know, setting aside COVID, but thinking of some of the other contexts that you've um, worked in in um, low and middle income countries. Um, so yeah, the Alphonse Simpson initiative started um, uh, quite a few years after the beginning of the influx of Syrian refugees into these countries. Um, so in 2011, um, some of the first big waves of fleeing the um, war and conflict in Syria uh, were driving um, large numbers of Syrian refugees across the borders. So um, at this point, uh, in the areas um, that the IRC is serving, that um, influx has lessened, um, certainly, in terms of numbers coming across uh, the border. And so uh, many of the children in these early childhood programs in Ahmed Simpson were actually born in the new country, right? So post um, uh, uh, settlement. And so um, we are a little bit more in the more um, uh, stable um, uh, context of the humanitarian um, uh, situation in that context. Um, in, for, in Bangladesh, the Rohingya, uh, the big influx started in the summer of 2017. So that's much more recent and um, uh, very, very concentrated as far as the geographic space, um, because this is really the um, uh, uh, the land that is kind of right next to Rakhine province is this district of Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh. Um, and so these 34 refugee camps were set up um, uh, uh, in very close, they're pretty much contiguous. So it's like one great big um, refugee camp, but they um, are divided. So, so there it is more recent, um, but um, this distinction between kind of immediate uh, humanitarian response and long-term settlement and um, uh, drove on Ahan Simpson this notion of both um, high contact and low contact interventions. So when you're, and the idea of the low contact intervention, so reach up and learn in the, um, this kind of idea of home visiting is, is actually a relatively high contact intervention. 12 months of services. Um, similarly, a full year of preschool would be considered a high contact intervention, um, even though in some other contexts it might be kind of considered fairly low intensity. Um, but within this um, sector, this notion of can we provide like a full year of preschool? Well, that's not really a certainty, right? So um, yeah, so the, so the low dosage interventions are things um, where actually the, um, the total number of hours, you know, might be quite a bit uh, less than 100 hours, for example, of contact with the family. And those were developed to be a little more responsive to the immediate crisis kind of situation where families might be on the move. Um, we also think that these phone-based um, interventions are also appropriate for the phone being the lifeline um, in many, many cases during flight um, uh, uh, or when you're really not yet settled um, to try to keep in touch uh, with caregivers and parents. Um, and so to, to that, and just a, a follow-up question, um, 
what you're learning now from these interventions because of COVID, do you see them having lasting power? This is somewhat, I think, milagros to your question. Um, I think it kind of follows on here that, um, you know, in thinking about mass media strategies in middle-income countries, do you see that some of what you might be learning now might last beyond the current crisis? That's the big question for the entire field, right? So we don't really know. Um, we are just starting to see some of these patterns of convergence, but not in, there's not enough studies in humanitarian context of follow-up. So in Ghana, work by Sharon Wolf, um, you know, following up teacher professional development in, um, uh, in preschools in Ghana um, uh, uh, has shown and suggests that you really do need to kind of sustain investments um, or think about some of the other approaches um, to, uh, to sustaining um, effects. And we have one other kind of three-year follow-up of an early home visiting intervention based in a social protection program in Colombia. Um, but the, we don't have um, many of these kind of medium-term follow-up uh, uh, evaluations. So we know very little. And so we always have a sense that the counterfactual, the comparison matters. Um, and that what you focus on during the intervention matters. Uh, we are just at the very, very beginning of starting to learn some of these things in the low and middle income countries, um, partly because we've been um, uh, often restricted uh, to um, uh, immediate post-test kind of impact evaluations. We do hope um, uh, and plan to start a, a long-term longitudinal study in Bangladesh as part of the LEGO initiative. Um, okay, we have some questions from Gloria Yeomans Maldonado, who's now at the University of Texas Health Services Center. She was a postdoc here at um, the Ford before this. Um, and so Gloria is asking um, a couple questions. Um, in your original media plus home visiting intervention, was the media about socio-emotional development and the home intervention focused on more school ready, uh, readiness outcomes? First question. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Um, so the um, the mass media uh, program, just to be clear, it has its own separate impact evaluation, just focused on the on the mass media. Um, and what's interesting about the social emotional aspect is that as the seasons, and there's going to be a total of four seasons. Uh, we think that starting with emotions, you know, does make some sense, um, and that then starting to build in some other domains of development, like social cognition um, or perspective taking um, and problem solving. Uh, those kinds of things we think um, are uh, going to raise some interesting questions about the breadth of social emotional outcomes that might be targeted across multiple seasons of a program. And we're currently exploring even the idea of like, would there be a you know, would we think of the impact evaluation not focusing on a single season, but on a kind of best of, <laughs> um, taking bits of multiple seasons that cover a broader um, uh, range of social emotional skills. So that's an interesting question around domain uh, breadth in a, uh, a mass media intervention. Uh, the home visiting program, um, is first of all targeted to younger kids. Um, the kind of sweet spot for Sesame programs traditionally has been the kind of um, four to six year old, um, even up to seven year old um, age range. And so that's where most of the, you know, the complexities of the plots, um, the kind of humor, uh, well, there's lots of different kinds of humor as we all know and, you know, in, in, in these programs. And um, for any of you who are, want to, to watch this, you should just, just um, uh, Google Ahmed Simpson, and uh, I was trying to get a subtitle. Um, uh, there, there's not much subtitling yet in English, um, as you might imagine. But I was trying to get some to put into the into the presentation, and, are, and that's not widely available quite yet. But um, yeah, so you can you can take a look. But um, but yeah, the home visiting programs are for younger kids and focus on these traditional areas, um, uh, somewhat traditional areas of kind of responsiveness and. Uh, and learning activities that are meant to um, foster um, both um, uh, outcomes on the social emotional end, but also um, uh, through some of these uh, more warmth and responsiveness kinds of mechanisms, but also some of the cognitive um, aspects of development through this, this stimulation. 
I'm going to keep going with Gloria's questions. Um, I think she may be working on some interventions in Texas <laughs> and have some questions that are that are um, targeted towards that. Um, but uh, for the um, phone-based intervention, you mentioned the activities were at adapted to skills levels. Can you talk more about how those skills levels were assessed? Um, they are assessed fairly informally because on the phone you can't really do direct child assessments. Um, and so this is not um, the kind of um, uh, independently assessed right child outcomes. This is more reported by the parent um, and whether they were able to do it. Because again, the home visitor is not there to observe whether the child can do it or not. So that's a very good question for how we think about this in phone based is like, um, uh, how detailed do we have to get in terms of asking the parent about, you know, what a child was able to do or not able to do and why they were not able to do it or the context in which they were not able to do it or able to do it, right? Or how do you get to this notion of like, it's kind of quote unquote, too easy, like kid gets bored, um, kids can get bored for different reasons um, versus something that's difficult, right? And, and these are things that are trained Part of the training for home visitors, but I think are much more challenging for phone-based interventions. Um, yeah, so so that key part of the program is again something that we're not sure um, is is will be there in the in the phone base. We can get a sense from the full recordings. We hope to get a sense of you know what these conversations are like and the probing um, around the context of learning. And I'm going to combine two, one from Gloria and one from Aditya um, Benjamin, which is um, around the scalability question, right? So this is around um, what are you hoping to learn um, in terms of cost and um, uh, to inform the next stages of um, scale-up? Yeah, so um, uh, we're working with the, our NGO partners around the um, approaches to costing. Um, and so those are uh, things that we are just starting those cost um, studies, uh, paying attention to both kind of startup um, and maintenance kinds of costs and the usual kind of range of, um, uh, of costs that might uh, occur. These are in certainly in a lot of the NGO um, planning and their finance um, uh, processes and budgeting processes and those uh, kinds of things. Um, the scaling effort is kind of going on simultaneously, which is that these are kind of contacts with NGOs and ministries in different countries. Um, uh, and it's a very important part of the initiative. And so um, one of our future impact evaluations might be in the context of scale. So as a program is scaling up um, and might be implemented by a ministry, um, for example, uh, rather than another NGO or by the IRC, um, that there may be opportunities and expansion to kind of leverage that for an impact evaluation. So that is um, uh, a thing we'll be exploring um, as as reopening happens. And of course, a lot of the scaling also got every everything is paused because you know every every NGO and every ministry is struggling right now with um, uh, just keeping up with their their um, their what they were doing before COVID hit. Um, for the causal inference crowd, and because we only have another minute or two for questions, I'm going to ask a detailed one, um, also from Aditya. Uh, how do you tackle this, the issue of attrition in the most design, especially with the smaller sample size compared to an RCT in general? Um, so when you have like those ends of 25, are you seeing that and, and what do you do? Because this is a yeah. new design to me in terms of this framing. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, of course, all of those um, issues of attrition, you know, still hold as a threat to the design, right? So, um, and just to be clear, um, that was just for an example to illustrate um, what that looks like. Our samples per country will be 2,000, um, uh, roughly 2,000. So they'll be relatively large and the interventions relatively short. Um, yeah, so, so we're thinking of, you know, this is really like something like uh, three or four weeks of texts. Um, and uh, that's still not fully decided because it's partly the, uh, whether the frequency of texts, um, you know, uh, twice a week versus every day, 
every other day. <laughs> uh, these are still some of the questions and that would also um, partly determine the ultimate length of the most um, phase. Um, but these are not going to be long interventions. They're gonna be nowhere near like 12 months of texts. Um, and then finally, um, the last question, um, can you talk a little bit more about the process that you went through to contextualize the Sesame Street um, in relation to the local culture and the need and why Sesame Street? Um, I know they were already doing some work, so that was part of it, but why, why is it uh, particularly well suited uh, for the needs of these communities? Um, so Sesame Workshop had um, developed two programs for the Middle East. Um, uh, and uh, Iftaya Simpson had been developed in Jordan, and so the <laughs> NGO Jordan, Jordan Pioneers had worked on that show. Um, and so they had experience already um, in the country, but not specifically around issues of um, refugees or migration um, and some of the kinds of particular developmental, uh, you know, focus that that might bring or content. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so, so of course, this is, um, uh, is not something that should displace local, locally developed media. Um, and so, um, and this is a partnership on the mass media side between Sesame Workshop and Jordan Pioneers, um, so, which is based in Amman. So, um, so to be clear, this isn't um, literally folks from New York coming in and, um, uh, you know, translating a show that's already been developed. Um, on the other hand, it is, these are both INGOs, and I think in parts of this initiative, we're also working with much smaller local NGOs, um, for example, in the context of Bangladesh, um, and they do bring a different uh, focus. And so there we are working on kind of um, integrating, for example, into the Bangladesh study for adolescent mothers, a youth empowerment kind of uh, perspective and the development of youth organizing and leadership um, kinds of skills um, through a little bit more of a participatory action research model that might be embedded within our longitudinal study. There um, we are um, uh, potentially partnering with a, a different kind of NGO that's not coming from outside the country that you know really arose from uh, uh, within the Rohingya population for example. So um, uh, I think um, the humanitarian sector, of course, is often um, uh, dominated by a large role for the international NGOs, but they are also often working with uh, local NGOs in a particular uh, context, um, should they exist. And it turns out, for example, that in Cox's Bazaar, because of the prior waves of migration going back 35 or 40 years, that there are NGOs um, that are local that arose within the context of those prior waves of migration. And then when the huge influx started happening in 2017, um, these NGOs also um, were playing a very important role with uh, things like setting up new um, uh, camps, um, uh, setting up um, things like the network of health clinics and playing a very important role um, so that it wasn't just the so-called um, very large INGOs that were um, providing services. And that's still true there in the camps today. Well, it's amazing work. I, I also just, you know, very quickly, how big is your team? Just to give us a size of, um, do you have any idea like how, how many people are involved in all the work you're talking about? Um, in New York, we have about, I think, um, 17 or 18 full-time folks working on um, these two initiatives on the early childhood side. And then we have um, a variety of, um, uh, partners, uh, researchers, and consultants from uh, working on site. Um, and then um, in terms of data um, collection, the IRC actually uh, uh, hires the um, data collectors on the Ahan Simpson initiative. And then in Bangladesh, uh, Innovations for Poverty Action is, um, and their Bangladesh office is our um, kind of uh, data and research um, partner. Um, but we're finding that for very complex issues like translation for the Rohingya language that we're, you know, kind of reaching out to further <laughs> uh, networks and, um, uh, and uh, resources and local, uh, very local expertise. Um, uh, so we have, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, 
it's as uh, does feel like a small army. I'm not used to this scale. <laughs> so it's been a, a lot of uh, uh, challenges, but we, yeah, we have a, a fantastic managing director. Alice Wormley is uh, the, the co-PI Larry Abers involved, um, and we have a fantastic managing director and Lizzie Goodfriend, um, uh, who has lots, years and years of experience in international development project management. So uh, that's been, yeah, she's been a lifesaver. <laughs> well, it, it really is extraordinary work, and we're so glad um, that we're able to sort of have you, you know, here uh, uh, for this talk. Um, and thanks for your flexibility as we had invited you to come in person and to be willing to, to go with this virtual format. Um, we're going to be all following your work closely from here onward. Um, and uh, we'll find a way to hopefully update the Michigan community as you learn more. Um, and we want to thank all of those people who are able to participate today, your patience with our technology issues at the beginning and for the questions. Um, we will be having more events this year through EPI. We actually have one coming up on November 19th in which we'll be hosting a panel of early literacy experts, including Dr. Nell Duke here at the University of Michigan School of Education, Pamela Mason from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, journalist Karen Chenoweth, and Paul uh, Liebenau, who is the Executive Director at uh, Michigan Elementary and Middle Schools uh, Principals Association. So really trying to blend policy practice and because this is a big topic in the media um, right now, uh, those perspectives. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for coming. Um, and um, Hero, um, stay safe. And we will look forward to hearing more about this work. Thanks, Chris, and everyone. Um, this is great. Um, and great questions. Thanks so much. Bye.